Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show. Brought to you this week by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. The Money and Wealth Show is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Here's Victor Adair. It is late July 2012. We're at the Agora Conference here in Vancouver, Canada. Bill, you've just got Bill Bonner. You've just you, got off the plane. Got off well, the plane. Welcome to Canada. Thank you. Again. It's fun being in Canada. We have been at this event a couple of times over the years, and I've had the pleasure to talk to you. You write the daily reckoning. You've got all of this, everything, the, the agora. There's so much going on. But to really, I guess, in 25 words or less, you, you make an assessment of what's going on in the financial markets, in the geopolitical markets, and pass your views on to various subscribers. Yes, that's what I do, and I do it, uh, I kind of, I refer to myself as a fuddy-duddy economist. Okay. Because the whole economics profession has been taken over by people who are not fuddy-duddies. <laughs> they're, they're uh, you know, they, they pretend to be scientists and they use a lot of numbers, but those numbers are all phony. And the more you get into it, the more you realize that the, that the, the, uh, the higher education in economics is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> and by the way, you, do you know that your country is empty? Empty? Yes. Well, I flew over here from Europe. Oh. And you fly over from Europe, you fly over the northern parts, and I was looking out the window, and I looked out the window for what seemed like hours. There were no roads, there were no cars, no houses, no, nothing. We call that's empty. That's the bush. It, there certainly is. I didn't even see any bushes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the outback in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a big country. We're, we like to think we're full of resources. Of course, uh, here just a couple of days ago, some giant Chinese company came in is going to oh, yeah. take over yeah. one of our oil producing companies. And we have a lot of resources. But let's, let's talk about okay. how you see the world. When we talked a few years ago here in the same room, I think your advice was for people to pretty much get conservative, that there were going to be tough times ahead, that they were going to see deleveraging pressures. Right. I think you were even talking in terms of deflation at that time when nobody else thought that was going to happen. Well, um, well, that's part of the big story that uh, while, if you go back to 2007, it was perfectly obvious that in America there was going to be a real estate crash mm -hmm. and there was going to be a credit, uh, the pre credit bubble was going to blow up. The, it didn't, you didn't need a PhD in economics to see that. And if you had a PhD, you probably wouldn't have seen it <laughs> because the leading economists did not. You know, they were focusing so heavily on how to, on their own mechanical systems for manipulating the economy that they couldn't see something that was right in front of them. Right. And now those same economists who did not see the bubble forming did not realize there was a problem, but they're the ones in charge of fixing the problem. And so about five years ago, whenever I think we were here, mm -hmm. you, know, we, we, you know, we were talking about the fact that there was a huge bubble, it's going to blow up, there's going to be trouble. And then maybe we talked about a year later, and uh, I think that I said, you know, you, you, can't fix the, you can't fix this by bringing in more credit. You can't fix a debt problem with more debt. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they're trying to do and been trying to do. So nothing has changed. I mean, for the last four years, we've been running through this uh, this scenario that we, uh, you know, that we saw pretty clearly, and it's probably, you know, it's it's classic. Even you know, you have a debt bubble, then you've got a debt deflation, and we've seen a lot of debt deflation in the, in in the world and a lot in, in America. And uh, on the other hand, you have the, the the Feds inflating. You know, they're leveraging up while the private sector deleverages. So we're caught in this kind of Japan-like situation have been for the last four years, and I don't see anything that's going to change it anytime soon. Some of our viewers might have seen me earlier talk about how I think that the activities of the governments and the central banks, I call them collectively the authorities, are really only a rear guard action in the face of this wave of private sector deflation. 
that's going on. Well, rear guard in the Soviet sense, where you shoot your own soldiers, that's what, <laughs> that's what it's all about. It's terrible, you know. It's like, in, you know, we have this argument goes on in the economics profession in which the, the austerity people say, mm -hmm. look, you just got to cut this off. And the Keynesians say, oh, no, look, if you came across, you know, you came across a drunk, he was walked out in the road and got hit by a car, and you, you wouldn't lecture him about temperance, you'd call an ambulance. But, but what do they do? They give the guy a drink right there on the street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't do any good. So you write a letter, still, a daily letter, the Daily, the, the daily, yeah, reckoning. daily reckoning. And, right. and I remember we meant we, that the word reckoning had sort of a Presbyterian ring to it. Yeah, it does. It, it suggests that uh, there's something else going on, something you can't tinker with. Yeah. That, uh, you know, the old economists used to call themselves moral philosophers. Yes. Because they thought this, the world worked in a way which you do something, and what you do has consequences. But now the new uh, economists think that, nah, you can just turn another bolt, twist a screw, throw a lever, throw a print some more money. You know, they think they can control the, the system. Yeah. They think they can kick the, car, the can so far down the road that we'll never find it. You so, think otherwise? I don't think that's happening. So with your daily reckoning letter that you write, what are you telling your people these days? Now, I mean, five years after you know you and I started to talk, what what are you saying these days? Well, I'm saying about the same thing. I think we're headed for Japan. <laughs> We've Japan. been headed for Japan for a long time. Okay, and and Japan <laughs> means for, for our J listeners. Japan means that the government stops the stops the the market from correcting itself. Mm -hmm. What it does, if if the government had stayed out of the authorities, you call them. If they had stayed out of the way, what would have happened in 2008? There would have been a huge sell-off. It, yeah. it would have been bad, it yeah. would have been bad. But bad is just what we needed. <laughs> we needed bad to clear out all, those ba all the bad debt. But instead, they did what they did in Japan, what all the authorities want to do. They want to stop bad, because bad doesn't help you get reelected, and mm -hmm. bad doesn't help you get, uh, get returned to the Fed. So, so they tried to stop it, and they stop it by, and now we're in this, this uh, phase which uh, they are calling a contained depression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's contained by what? It's contained by printing more money, by more money in the public sector mostly to keep the jobs going, to keep everything moving. But uh, containing a depression is not, to me, a very good thing. I'd like to have the depression out of the way. I, you know, in the, in the old days, you know, back in the 19th century, they had depressions fairly frequently. Mm -hmm. But the depression, they lasted for about 18 months. And it was long enough just to wipe out the bad decisions, wipe out the mistakes, clear the decks, and then people could start up again. And that's, of course, what we're, mm -hmm. what, what we're doing now in Europe, America, and Japan is a system where the government, you know, following the Keynesian theory, you know, they're replacing the demand that the uh, private sector doesn't have. And in that way, they keep anything from clearing out. The market never clears. The debt never clears away. So we're stuck. Stuck, so we kind of, maybe to use John Malden's words, we kind of muddle along is the best we can hope for? Yeah, yeah, muddling, <laughs> we muddle for a while, but then finally you can't muddle. I mean, as the debt builds up in the public sector, eventually something gives. Okay. And what, we're, what, what I think is most amazing right now is how much debt can build up in a public sector before something gives. You know, right now, because of the, the mentality has shifted towards a fear mentality. And in a fear mentality, what people want is their money back. You know, they're not too concerned about getting a return on it. And if you give your money to the U.S. federal government, you'll get your money back. And if you give your money to Japan, you'll get it back, because they print it up, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the system works so that the fear raises the, the interest in, uh, in putting money into the government which lowers interest rates, which holds the every, everything sort of locked into this contained depression uh, pattern. And it could be that way for a long time. I mean, that's the frightening thing, that it's hard to see what mechanism exactly comes, comes into play that, uh, that changes things. And as we've seen in Japan, it's gone on for 20 years. So we could, we could begin for another five, 10 years of this. Well, could, could we imagine for a moment what might cause that to break? I mean, for instance. Well, yeah, for instance, what happens, I think what happens eventually is that investors get scared, that people 
people realize that there's no, there's no exit. When you get up to, like Japan's got 200% of GDP and it's, it's public debt, there's no way you can't pay that money. And you can't pay that money back. And in Japan, they can't possibly grow their way out. You know, the, the population in Japan is falling. Right. You know, they're not going to grow. grow. So, uh, so at some point, some uh, investors start to, to change their way of looking at things. They say, look, if I give my money to Japan or give my money to America or to the Europe now, uh, you know, they can't pay it back. And so somehow that's not a good bet. But then, I, I, it, and I don't know when that happens. I, it's never happened. You know, this is, this is a, we're in uncharted territory here. This time it's different? This time it is different. <laughs> <laughs> How but, different but, it is, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I assume we'll end up, I have, my theory is what, you know, which I think I gave you five years ago, is still the same. Deflation now, inflation later. Japan now, Argentina later. Yeah, yeah. But the deflation could continue that the deflationary pressure. The, 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 stu the interesting thing that's happened in the last four years is that we've seen how durable that, uh, that period of debt deflation, which the authorities try to compensate with, uh, with the leverage in the public sector, we have seen how durable that model is. When we look at Europe right now, I'm going to remind everybody we're talking, it's late July 2012. We've just seen Spanish uh, yields, Italian yields, get higher and higher, while it, some of the perceived safe haven countries have got below zero uh, nominal interest rates. That, seemed, that would seem to be a, a symptom of money yeah. being driven by fear to fear, get, to get fear away from market. one place yeah. and go to someplace safe. Um, would, would that maybe escalate and be the trigger? that you're talking about is not, not really? Uh, I don't think so. I think okay. I, I've just been on a, a, a tour of Europe's ragged edge. I went okay. to Ireland and to Spain and I was in France. But uh, it looks to me as though they've got to try to get themselves into the US situation where the ECB can somehow, you know, G Germany's got to loosen up and, and allow the uh, central bank to print the money to cover the bonds because otherwise they're going to the, the uh, Spain, Ireland and uh, Greece are going to fracture off and then they're, it, that'll be very hard to contain. You know, the authorities, what they most want is control. And uh, they, they can kind of control things as long as they can keep everybody together and keep bailing out and keep buying up bonds, even if it's kind of awkward the way they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Still, they've got the situation sort of under control. But once they start l allowing these uh, member nations to flake off, you know, like uh, Greece, which I understand now uh, the latest thing is that they, they do intend to do that. But once they do, then, then we don't know what's going to happen. And in Europe, it, you know, Europe could just fall apart. I don't think it will. I don't think they'll let Greece go, but I, I don't know. Do you think the, the, the debt crisis in Europe, let's say in particular, say in the, the periphery countries, is the, solving that debt crisis is made that much tougher when you see that the citizens in Germany and the other countries are getting increasingly vocal. They don't want to send their money to bail these guys out. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big problem. Europe has a, a political problem that yeah. the U.S. doesn't have. Yeah. It has exactly, almost exactly the same financial problem, but Europe also has the political problem. However, what Americans don't realize is that that political problem is a good thing. You know, that's what's keeping them from doing what the U.S. is doing. The U.S. is fundamentally saying, don't worry, give us money, we'll give you back paper. And people are happy with that trade as long as, uh, long as they're in this fear mode. Europe can't do that, not quite. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to get itself together so it will do that. Because if it doesn't, then Europe, each state of Europe is like California or like Illinois. It somehow has to find a way at the end of the day to pay its, its, its own expenses. And uh, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But it makes it very awkward in the, in the meantime. And if you're holding a bond from uh, Greece, you know, you're, 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 you're sweating a little bit, hoping that somebody's going to come and bail you out because you made a bad decision. And of course, it was, markets are supposed to wipe out those bad decisions. You know, the bad decisions are not supposed to be bailed out by the authorities. So we're in this odd situation where all over the world, the government is trying to avoid people from getting what they have coming to them. 
before we wrap up, okay, we're in this odd situation as you've described. I know we were talking just before we started the tape that you're involved in creating a family office for yourself, the advice that you write in your daily letter and, and, and the different things, Agora, given that we're in this odd situation that you've just described. What should our listeners be doing if they want to hang on to their purchasing power? Well, there's not much, uh, you know, right now, they're, 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 there's not much good advice out there because the situation is unprecedented. We don't know how it's going to, it'll blow up, uh, there's no doubt about that, but we don't know when. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I hold gold, and I think everybody ought to hold gold because the central banks can't be counted on to protect the money. So you've got to act as your own central bank. You've got to hold some gold. In the short run, it doesn't look like there's any problem with just holding currency. So I would be holding cash and gold. And I wouldn't hold, think about holding much else because the stocks could fall any day. They could crash. I don't think the currencies are going to crash like that. They'll crash eventually, but not soon and not quickly. So uh, cash and gold is really the only safe place right now. So, I mean, we're leaving real estate off the list? Well, real estate is very particular. That's not a yeah. liquid investment. But, okay. yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to buy real estate. I was in Ireland trying to buy real estate. Why? It's hard to buy it. Why? Well, because it's crashed. It's, you can get properties that have been down 80% and down from what they were a few years ago. There's a lot of distressed property in Ireland. We have an office in Ireland, so I was trying to buy a building for the office. But it's hard to make the deal. The, you know, nobody wants to recognize that the properties are down that low. Of course, there's no financing either. But, okay. but, but the ideal deal, if you could make it, is, you, is to buy a house. Buy a house at a, a, a distressed price and mortgage it for 30 years, the lowest mortgage rates ever. I mean, that's a good deal. Eventually, that's going to be a very good deal. But you know, not everybody can do that. Not everybody's in a position to buy a house. And you might not want to do that in Vancouver. You may not. I didn't say Vancouver. <laughs> I'm talking about Florida. <laughs> <laughs> it's late July 2012. We're at the Agora Conference, and we have had the pleasure of talking with Mr. Agora himself, Bill Bonner. Welcome once again to Canada. Thank Thanks Thank for you. being with us. Thank you. The Money and Wealth Show has been brought okay. to you by American Manganese Good, good, good. First take every time. Every time. <laughs>